Judas is the most problematic male character in the Passion story. In contrast to the excesses of a wild woman, and like so many of us still, he seemingly could not believe in an economy of passion and glory beyond the economy of exchange and order. Perhaps the most revealing thing that the Gospel of John has already told us of Judas is that it was he, the keeper of the purse, who was the most affronted at a woman's excessive show of love and grief, wasting three hundred denarii's worth of precious nard. How ironic, but how consistent too, that in another gospel tradition it was for thirty pieces of silver that Judas himself betrayed his Lord. Judas knew what was worth what, and how things should be ordered. Perhaps he even wanted to order Jesus' victory in some supernatural way by arranging a splendid denouement with the high priestly party in which Jesus would be overtly established as Messiah. I suspect so, but we can only guess. Yet there is more to Judas than initially meets the eye, more indeed than the layers of negative projection within the New Testament. We see these layers build. Judas is not just a purse keeper, but also the money grubber, the thief, the one whom Satan entered into, and in the Book of Acts, the almost pathetic pantomime figure whose guts burst open as he fell headlong in his tainted field. Of blood. In that last strand of tradition, he is satisfyingly humiliated as well as exposed, rather like the heretic、uh, Arius three centuries later, who, to the delight of his orthodox enemies, met his end in a public lavatory. So much for them. The two of them, Judas and Arius, appear together in medieval manuscript illustrations, along with Satan, safely trodden down under Christ's feet. But none of these negative projections about Judas captures the subtlety and strangeness of what John's gospel underlyingly has to say about him. It is the idea of a necessary betrayal. One that God not only allows but makes a central part of His plan, even as Satan also gets the better of Judas. By long tradition, the Church separates Judas from Jesus' own excessive expression of love and communion in the foot washing, in the sequence of Holy Week readings. But here in John's Gospel, betrayal and love are intrinsically entangled. It seems that this terrible paradox of love and betrayal is an intrinsic part of the awful stuff of passion. Read chapter thirteen of John as a whole, and you will see that when Jesus washes his disciples' feet and sits at table with them to eat his last meal on earth, Judas figures in every paragraph. We might even say Judas is the center of attention, the focus of the evening. We cannot avoid him. Judas' feet are washed, along with all the others. He is brought to the table of love and communion, and again marked out for special treatment. Jesus twice predicts his own betrayal. And taking a special morsel of bread, the word is one that ironically would later mean the Eucharistic host. Dips it into the dish and gives it specially and first to Judas. Then Jesus quietly instructs him, "Do what you have to do quickly." In this gospel, Jesus gives Judas permission and even orders him to do the job that he has to do. The passion cannot happen without him; he is the necessary hinge of it, where life and death, love and betrayal, intermingle and contend. This is indeed Judas' night. So here we meet the heart of the matter at its most paradoxical. Judas, the betrayer, is central to the plan of salvation. 
Indeed, the word used for Judas as betrayer more accurately or literally means to hand over. This verb, rather than the one that more strictly means betray, is the one invariably used of Judas in the New Testament, except only once quite exceptionally in the Gospel of Luke. That word play between hand over and betray, therefore, is present every time Judas is mentioned. It is actually handing over Jesus that is Judas' divinely intended and necessary work to do, even as he also betrays him. Jesus, because of Judas, becomes the one who can be handed over to his own passion. And now, in his handed over state, made passive to the world, Jesus manifests his love in a new way. Only thus does he enter into his glory. He will now speak little, where before he taught, he does no miracles, whereas before marvels attended him. He will despair in the garden, whereas before he triumphed. Now he is despised, whereas before he was delighted. Now he dies, whereas before he brought others back to life. Jesus is constrained into a new posture of pure, passive love. All this unfolds as a result of Judas' necessary act of handing over. The Judas question cuts deep into the heart of the problem of our own uncleanness as we approach the passion, of our own experiences of betraying as well as of being betrayed. Can betrayal and true divine love coexist? If it was necessary that Jesus be handed over, if being handed over in this way is of the essence of Jesus' love and passion, then why must Judas suffer for it? Why must he be betrayed as a betrayer when what he did in handing over was what he had to do for the sake of the very unfolding of the glory of that divine love? The final strand of tradition about Judas in the Gospels is that after the betrayal in terrible anguish and remorse, he went out and hanged himself. A 5th century artist carves it thus delicately on the lid of an ivory casket. Two men hang on trees. One is Jesus, stripped on the cross, dying of love. The other is Judas, suspended from his own tree, dying of despair. There's nothing here of the pantomime triumphalism against the defeated traitor. Instead, this way seems to tell us that suicide, despair of God's mercy, is the tragedy, not betrayal as such. If betrayal is so deep a part of human sin and so profoundly entangled also with the story of love and salvation, then it cannot actually be betrayal per se that must be repressed or obliterated in the passion. Rather, the amazing possibility is that even betraying as well as being betrayed can become part of the terrible stuff of being handed over to the full and deepest meaning of Christian love. God can make love excessive love, even out of human betrayal. On this view, Judas' tragedy was that, unlike Peter, he despaired of that possibility. He could not conceive of that excessive sort of forgiveness. And indeed, who knows but that God may have still forgiven him after death. I cannot myself believe the divine love does not extend to the terrible agony of suicide. And Jesus said, What you are going to do, do quickly. Now is the Son of Man glorified. Here's a truth that even the earliest church found hard to swallow, lurching between condemnation of Judas in the New Testament and the other extreme of Gnostic adulation of him in the so-called Gospel of Judas. 
But John's gospel intimates that the truth lies deeper than these two alternatives. For in the fallen realm of the desire to order and control, the act of handing over can strangely coexist with the form of human love, which tragically resists the true vulnerability and excess of divine love. Yet even this distortion of love, God can weave into his plan, allowing God's Son thus to be handed over, and holding out again and again the offer of forgiveness and grace to the betrayer. The trouble is, we too go on resisting the central truth of passion, We prefer the strange combination of repeated attempts to control and its polar opposite, despair. Here then is Judas, the balancer of the books, the hander over of Christ to his passion, the tragic man of despair. Look on him, for this is Judas' night, and so it is also our night the night of misplaced desire for control, the night of misguided despair of mercy, which only God's Son can cure and heal. Let's pray. Eternal God, you love your all creatures dearly. Also, forgive all who repent. Your love transcends our betrayal, even makes our betrayal a channel of your love. Let us get rid of our greed to control over your world. Also, let us not fall into despair because of the failure of control, but let us hope our eternal salvation through Christ so that we can repent and turn ourselves from the greed and foolishness. Amen.